Frank Capra is a Hollywood legend. He is a man respected by his peers, idolized by young filmmakers, three times president of the Directors Guild of America, four times president of the American Motion Picture Academy, and a man who enjoys probably more popularity in the 70s than he did even in the 30s. And Frank Capra once said about his own work, I respect films because I know what goes into them. Nobody starts out to make a bad film. I take my hat off to anyone who can complete a picture. They can't all be successes because we're dealing with an art form, and there are no formulas. Mathematics and art don't speak the same language. The best pictures are yet to be made. And I offer you that statement back to you because there are many people who feel that some of the best American films ever made were made by Frank Capra. Well, uh, uh, I don't know whether to drop dead or to keep going, <laughs> but uh, I thank you for that statement. It's, uh, it's a very flattering statement to make. I want to share something with you because there is a wonderful new book which is a companion piece to your own autobiography, which you, by the way, called the name above the title right. for all the right reasons. But the films of Frank Capra, one of the things I like about it is that a lot of people have been allowed to express their feelings about you. And I'm thinking specifically of the Honorable William O. Douglas, United States Supreme Court, who yes. wrote about you in this yes. new book. Frank Capra was the Carl Sandburg of Hollywood who reminded all America of the faces of Americana we love and cherish. In a sense, his productions portrayed good versus evil, yet more accurately, he set the homely virtues of small-town America against the greed of the marketplace, the corruption of politicians, and the danger of fascism. He made a hero out of the most obscure person. Isn't Do you agree that, with that? Isn't that something for, for a Chief Justice or, or an Associate Justice to uh, say things like that about you. I just, uh, you know, uh, after all, I, I'm just a, a son of illiterate peasants, you know, and I got it. Um, and uh, uh, came up the hard way in every way, and then to have a, a somebody's like somebody isn't well known as Chief Justice that I just say that that about you is, I, uh, I, I nearly wept when I read that. I just felt so deeply and so humbly and so and so proud that uh, I, I know how my mother and father would have loved to have read that. When you, when you tell us about being the son of immigrant parents and we know about your birth in Palermo, Italy, your Sicilian background, your arrival in America, how you put yourself through school, what, what propelled you? What, what drive was in you? It's difficult to uh, to look back and wonder, and uh, you can only just conjecture. But I did want an education. I I w I was ashamed of my parents because they couldn't read or write, and I wanted to get out of that ghetto. Uh, you know, ghettos. We think of ghettos as terrible places to live in, but there are people who pre prefer living in ghettos than any other place because they live with their own kind. They live with people they know, and they live with problems that they all have, but they always complain, always complaining about something, people in ghettos. So for me, it was a, it was a wonderful thing to get out of a ghetto and, that, and discover America, and discover, uh, uh, discover the American who, who never lived in ghettos and who never wanted to live that way, and who was uh, independent in his own right, and, and who who wasn't afraid to, uh, uh, and who feared nothing and who went about his business and did his own work. And uh, this, this is where my love for Americans started, is after I saw them, uh, after, when I was about 22, 23, 24, when I didn't have, didn't have a job, I couldn't find a job of any kind. And when I did a lot of running around in Utah and Oregon, uh, California, and met the farmers, the barbers, uh, the, the the poker players, on and on, and and just just fell in love with Americans because of their wonderful independence. Just they're just you know, hey, I am so and so, and that's it. I'm a, I'm I'm a man. I'm a person. I'm an individual. I'm not somebody else, and I don't give a damn what you are. This I this I thought, and this was a basic uh, basis of. Uh, my 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 wonderfully my 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 deep-seated 
love for the individual as against the crowd, as against the mob. And, uh, and uh, that, uh, th that each individual has a, do you realize that there's nobody ever been born like you? Nobody will ever be born again like you. You are one. You are the only one. You are unique. One person, one mole. The mole and the mole is broken. That makes you something very, very important to be a unique living being, living human being, and the only one that was ever you. Uh, this always struck me as a, as as as, as uh, just a, just a uh, uh, what greater what what get what greater glory than to be just one unique person, more glory than the king, queen, or anything else. To me. So that's why I've always had such a great, great, great admiration for the individual, and 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 and, and, uh, and my films have always been built around the, an individual, the strength, the inner strengths, the hidden strengths, and uh, of the individual. Speaking of of unique and oneness, if one begins to examine the people who have been directed by you, I'm thinking specifically at the moment of Claudette Colbert, because we know that Claudette Colbert's first job in front of a camera was being directed by Frank Capra. Oh, yes. That was first a job. Terrible film. And uh, it practically drove her out of film. She says, oh, I'm never going to pitch this. Is really, she, she came from the stage, and, and uh, the film was so bad that she, that she stayed away from films for a very long time. And then when we finally got together, back together again, and, uh, and you can't, and uh, happened it happened one night. Uh, she still remembered that I had made the worst film in the world with her, and she kind of uh, never got over it, really. You know, it's so easy to talk about it happened one night now, because we all know that it ran off that year with five Academy Awards yeah. and did things for Gable that nothing had done before. Right. But is it true that when you began It Happened One Night, that Gable did not want to do the film and had originally said, I won't do it? Gable did not want to do the film because he was... Uh, he was being sent to Siberia. He had some argument with Mr. Louis Mayer, and Mr. Louis Mayer was punishing him. Now, the punishment for these great stars at MGM was to send them to Poverty Row, Gower Gulch, around where, where I worked, and, and let, them make, let them make a picture down there with the, with the, with the, with the Hoi Polloi. And see, then they'd like MGM more, you see. Actually, we were, calling, we, were, we, were, we were calling the picture off. We couldn't cast it. No girl wanted to play it. Um, no man wanted to play it. I don't know. We couldn't. We couldn't cast it. When we suddenly got this call from Mr. Louis B. Mayer, who said, I, "I've got just the man for you." For, for and, and, and Harry Cohen says, "No, we're not going to make the picture." He says, "Harry, I'm 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 asking you to make the picture. I want to I want to punish a boy I have out here, an actor. I want to punish him. Do you take him?" So we had to make the picture in order that Louis Mayer could punish Clark, Clark Gable. Some punishment. <laughs> <laughs> a whole Academy Awards worth. All the Academy Awards are all in the five major, not major, they're all major, the five most publicized Academy Awards. The first time any picture had uh, won, all the, all won, won those five, and it took uh, something like 43 years for it to be duplicated when, uh, when this wonderful picture uh, uh, over the cuckoo's nest, uh, equal it. It's a record can only be equal. It can't be. It, 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 can't, it, can, only, it can only be tied. It can't be beaten. Tell us. Tell us how you feel, Frank. When when you go to a screening at the Directors Guild and you see something like Ross Hunter's musical remake of Lost Horizon, when you know how how people feel about your original Lost Horizon. I did not see uh, the Ross Ross Hunter's uh, uh, the. A couple of friends saw the opening and they, they called me up and say, stay home. So I knew what they meant. And I, I am not a man who, 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 who enjoys failures in others. I know, I know what they spent an awful lot of money in that film. They got the best cast. They, got the, they did the best of everything to try to remake Lost Horizon. The, they failed, but not because they didn't try. They fail because, uh, let's say, you're in a you're in a you're in show business. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. 
and you never know what, what the reasons are. But uh, they did everything they could to make to make that, and I and I feel sorry for them that they didn't come off because they did not stint on anything. Remakes are very difficult to make. Speaking of remakes, I want to ask you something about yeah. you because when you say remakes are difficult, yes, I tried to. You came out in 1961 and you remade one of your own classics, Lady for a Day, yes. which you then called Pocketful of Miracles. Yes. You found yourself working with Betty Davis, Glenn yes. Ford, Hope Lang, yes. and Margaret, Peter Falk. Somebody quoted you once as saying, after Pocketful of Miracles, I thought I'd lost my touch. Why, why did you say that about Pocketful of Miracles? Uh, because I couldn't make it and I wanted to make it. Um, I wanted to make, the reason I wanted to make Lady for a Day over again was that Lady for a Day is fundamentally a fairy tale. Now, in Lady for a Day, the actors knew it was a fairy tale. They tried hard not to know it, but they knew it. I wanted to make uh, Lady for a Day again with the actors not knowing it's a fairy tale, not playing a fairy tale. And see and see how, how how it would come out with with tough real realistic characters, not caring about not 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 being whimsical at all about the whole thing, but tough tough realistic characters and see if the fairy tale idea would come out of out of reality. Uh, I didn't get to do that because the um, the, uh, the the actors immediately knew they were in a fairy tale and so they all became whimsical. And this is and, and this is. The, the, the bane of our existence is, is that actors read the script and they know the end, and they start playing the end before they, before they get there. And this happens time and time and time again. I wouldn't have thought Betty Davis was capable of being whimsical. And not, not Betty Davis. Betty Davis has played her part beautifully. She hated the film. She hated uh, Glenn Ford. She hated me uh, because uh, uh, she's the kind that you must argue with. You must fight with, with her over a, uh, I, I never found this out about her. Uh, uh, I was pro I had my own problems with terrific headaches, and and I didn't get to know Betty Davis as I should have known her. I was done right by her. I didn't do right by her because I, I didn't discover what made her act. Every actress, every actor is different. You got to they got to have a different approach. You got to find what makes the what how you can get their best performance. I did not do that with Betty Davis. I did not find out what uh, what uh, made her best performance, and uh, and what it is is that she needs argument. She needs fights. She wants to fight over the part. She wants to argue with the part. She wants to give you all the reasons why the, that scene is bad, and then you've got to then you've got to uh, fight back. And this she loves, and out of it comes this thing that that is Betty Davis. I did not do that, and. Uh, so she was worried, worried about the part constantly. She gave a great performance. Why did she hate Glenn Ford? Why, why do so many people dislike that man in Hollywood? Um, I think that was a personal thing, and I, and I, uh, I think we better skip it. All right. Let's let's talk about somebody else who was a <laughs> <Yeah>. controversial figure. <laughs> you also have worked with Frank Sinatra, and I'm thinking of Hole in the Head. Yes. Wonderful film. I, I it reminds me. I say Frank Sinatra, and I remember that along with Eleanor Parker and a lot of other Thelma yes. Ritter, Carolyn Jones was in that movie for yes. you, and I always felt she was one of the most underrated actresses. Yes. But Carolyn Jones was the one who called Frank Capra the Italian leprechaun. <laughs> well, I don't know what she meant by that. Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're an Irishman, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, I suppose my question is, I wanted to talk about Frank Sinatra, your working relationship with him, because he's he's known as one-take Sinatra. Maybe. If the director doesn't get it in one take, forget it, he goes home. He's known as very tough on, on, on directors, that's right. Uh, and, he, and, he, and But he is, I, I don't know, I, I found him the most cooperative guy I could be. Absolutely fine by him. He's one of the he's, he's one of the world's greatest greatest people. He's tough to handle. He wants to live his own life. He's trying to live it as an individual. His great his great popularity, you know, is is against is against him all the time. He's always got these, but but that man does more for charity, does more for 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 people than than anybody that I know of. He is he he is one of our greatest actors. I I tried to. 
talk a minute playing Paul. Saul turned into Paul. And I think he would be the greatest Saul in the world because you see it was a great conversion of a, of a tough little guy into a man, into a man that, was, that uh, really created the Christian church. Now, that, 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 took, that took a lot of acting, but I, I, but I thought he could do it. That's how I was an actor, I thought. I think he's a great dramatic actor. And, uh, and he, of course, does not think so. And he thinks he's only great, he feels great in saloon, as he calls it, singing to people. But he never sings the same songs twice to the same audience. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, this is what keeps him from. Uh, you you can't take this. His second take is no good. His third take is worse. His fourth take is and he, by this time he's he, he's finished. And for some reason or another, he just does. He, he, when he repeats something, he loses something. <clears throat> this also was applied to, uh, to Barbara Stanley when she was young. She would leave her first take in the in the rehearsal, her best take. And, and the same same way with uh, with the uh, now I had a different problem with Sinatra because I had an actor working with Sinatra who wanted to rehearse all day and who got better as he rehearsed. Sinatra got worse as he rehearsed. As a matter of fact, he got bad. So I couldn't rehearse them together. And and Robinson was very very annoyed That's because Edward he, G. Robinson. Edward G. Robinson. He wanted to rehearse all day. He'd find new little things as he rehearsed. He did. Uh, rehearsing for him was a was a, was a thing of the, of the theater, and, uh, and 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 he would find the character as he rehearsed. Sinatra had the character like that; he didn't have to find anything, and he'd lose it if he rehearsed it. Well, this was quite a problem, and uh, we had some we had some difficulties with it. But it's an amazing thing how 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 wonderful Sinatra is in that first take. How 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 he. How he pouts and how you know and how his face he doesn't have that he doesn't have that that bubble anymore he just gets mad he just gets gets mad if he has to do a scene over and over again. You know you you tell us stories about Frank Sinatra, Barbara Stanwyck, Edward G. Robinson, and I can add the names: Gary Cooper, James Stewart, yep. Cary Grant, Gene Arthur. Yep. What is a star? What's your definition of a star? My definition of a star. I wish I could give you one. As opposed to an actor. Uh, they're not synonymous. Now, it, 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 it can be that a star can be a great actress or a great actor. That's okay, too. But it can be that they cannot be, they can be mediocre in acting and still be stars. Whatever it is, you're born with it. You can't create it. You can't make it. You can't buy it. You can't sell it. You can't hire it. There's no way to make a star. Many, many men have gone broke trying to make their, their they're, they're, you know, they're sweet, they're, they're sweeties in the stars. It doesn't work, can't work. You're born with it, born with that quality, whatever it is, of charisma, uh, uh, leadership, attraction. But a star walks into a room, everybody knows it. They're all heads turn. And it's just, just there's something about a star that is a star that uh, I suppose, uh, now Hitler had that. Hitler was a star. Hitler had this great command of people, the great attention, great, uh, great uh, the, the trust of people. Did you ever meet Hitler? No. Why did you choose that name? That's interesting. Why didn't you say Churchill? Well, because uh, because Hitler would be a more uh, uh, offensive uh, thing. But he was a star. You see, he wasn't a villain. He just, villains can be stars. I'm trying to, trying to trying to tell you, villains can have that quality of, of leadership uh, as well as Churchill. Churchill, of course, was, uh, the stardom all written all over. Will you tell us about the time that Frank Capra was directing Winston Churchill in oh, his? Oh, I tried to direct him. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, he was writing something, uh, and and it was, uh, uh, a sort of an introduction to the Why We Fight series of Battle of Britain. And he was a great fan of the films we made in the army, great, great fan. And he called me in and he said, "If you bring your material, your equipment in, I'll, I want to write, I want to write an introduction that will show to the whole British public." He came in, and I saw the chief of, uh, God, my God, that's too long. I mean, I could take the papers. And I, I asked him, could I have a voice test with him? And so he read something. And I said, oh, okay, this is going to take, this, is, this won't work. It's too long. So I, I, I said, 
Uh, Mr. PM, uh, w would you mind speeding it up a little bit? We're making it. He looks up at me over his glasses and he says, young man, I've been making speeches long before you were born. And I suddenly realized I was talking to the greatest orator, orator in the world and trying to tell him how to do it. Uh, I, I know my face got very red and I slammed and I backed up and I you know, did everything and I got, ba got behind the safety of the camera. And when I was behind the camera, I had a little more courage. And I finally said to him, well, well Mr. PM, the, the audience is gonna pay you to hear this speech. <laughs> and he slammed back. <laughs> Can we talk about contemporary? Man of the century. Man of the century. True. Speaking of man of the century and people, new people in the film industry, when, when you talk about stars and you give us the definition you have of what a star is, what do you think of Barbara Streisand? Star. Jane Fonda? Star. Lee Bowman? Star, yes. They... they they have, uh, 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 they have many things to overcome personally, looks, uh, ideas, and so forth, still stars. Frank, somebody asked you once why you had stopped making film, and you were quoted as saying, I did it all, let the young ones do it now. I, I mean that. I mean, it's a young man's game. Uh, it, it takes so much uh, drive, it takes so much uh, uh, nervous energy and it takes so much and it takes guts it takes guts it takes courage courage is the one thing you must have you may have all the others beauty legs all uh, you know all that but if you haven't got any courage you, you haven't got it courage is the is the one single quality you must have to to, to make films or to make anything in show in show business the courage to follow a hunch courage to to follow uh, to do something against all kinds of opposition and hang on to that and hang on to that I thank you for the films you've given us <laughs> okay <laughs>